Hello, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to another segment of the Vestibular Disorders Association Live. We're bringing you live interviews with information that will help you navigate on your journey back to balance. October is National Protect Your Hearing Month. And some of you may be wondering, why are we talking about protecting your hearing and tinnitus in the vestibular disorders group? Well, the vestibular system end organs are in the inner ear and they share physical space and nerves and blood supply with your hearing system. So sometimes um, a vestibular problem may also impact just because of proximity, a person's hearing. And like vestibular problems, they can be in one or both ears and the symptoms vary widely from person to person. And just to give you some context for today's talk, we're gonna be talking about tinnitus, which is a symptom not a condition, but like vertigo, it's helpful to describe its characteristics. So sometimes hearing problems in vestibular patients can have a gradual onset, they can be constant or fluctuating, and they can make things louder or they can make things softer, or they can be an introduction of sounds that aren't really actually coming from the external world. They aren't actual sounds that others can hear. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is tinnitus. Um, and that is a symptom of hearing in the hearing system where a person hears a sound auditorily convinced that it is a real sound that others in the room cannot hear. We're going to be talking to Glenn Schweitzer today and we have Danielle Tolman with us today as usual, my wonderful co-host, and she's going to introduce us to our guest. Hello, everybody. We're very, very excited to have Glenn here. I just want to give you a little bit of a background on who Glenn is. Glenn Schweitzer is a tinnitus coach, blogger, and author of two books, which are Rewiring Tinnitus and Mine Over Meniere's. He's a passionate, he is passionate about helping others who suffer from tinnitus and vestibular disorders and volunteers as an ambassador for the Vestibular Disorders Association. Glenn has worked with more than 800 tinnitus sufferers one-on-one -on -one all over the world, helping them to find relief from the ringing in their ears. His mission is to raise awareness for tinnitus, Meniere's disease, and other vestibular disorders while spreading his message of hope to those in need. So welcome, Glenn. We're so excited to have you here. Hey, guys. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Absolutely. Well, um, in honor of National Protect Your Hearing Month, we're going to have you talk to us about tinnitus or tinnitus. First of all, how do you say the word? <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> But I say tinnitus, so you're going to hear me saying tinnitus when, as we're talking today, just as a habit. But actually, both pronunciations are correct. Tinnitus and tinnitus are both correct pronunciations. But I just, I say tinnitus for whatever reason. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, well, what's your story? So I bet when you were five or six years old, you know, your kid, you wanted to be a fireman or a policeman or a doctor or something. You didn't know you'd be a tinnitus rewiring specialist and consult. Yeah you know, con consultants for them around the world. What, how did you, what is a little bit about you and your story and how you got into this? Yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely didn't think I was going to be doing anything like this with, with uh, my career. Uh, well, um, let's see. So first of all, thanks again for, for having me. Uh, I, it, as, as you mentioned, I've been an ambassador with, with Vita for a long time now. Um, and, I've authored two books, um, Mind Over Meniere's and Rewiring Tinnitus. And, and like you said, Kathleen, I, I do work with tinnitus patients all over the world as a tinnitus coach. I want to start by saying, though, that I myself am a Meniere's and tinnitus patient who suffered greatly uh, early on, but I ultimately was successful in finding ways to manage my Meniere symptoms and also find lasting relief for my tinnitus, uh, which is obviously what we're here to talk about today. Uh, so my, my journey with chronic illness and this whole world started about a decade ago, 10 years ago, roughly, uh, when I was in my early 20s. Um, and I was finishing up college at the time at Florida Atlantic University. And at the time, I was I was studying business intelligence. So I thought I was going to be doing something with like, big data and, you know, data analysis. And um, that's sort of where I, I, I saw my my life heading um, when Meniere's and tinnitus first reared their ugly head uh, and turn my life upside down. Um, interesting side note, my wife now works for a data management company and she had gone to school for psychology to work with people in sort of a similar capacity that I'm doing. So we sort of like switched roles. Um, but anyways, fast forward a bit. And uh, so I suffered for a long time, but if you fast forward a bit, I live an amazing life with tinnitus and Meniere's now. I still have both conditions. There's no cure. Uh, for Meniere's or tinnitus, and my symptoms do flare up from time to time, my tinnitus included, 
Uh, but I manage both incredibly well. And over time, I, I just have focused on building and writing and spreading my message of hope. And, and now today, I, I've dedicated my life to helping others to find ways to manage and improve their quality of life with Miniere's and tinnitus. And I never in a million years thought that this is what I would end up doing for a living. But here we are. And I couldn't be happier with how this all turned out. You know, for those who haven't had tinnitus, it seems surprising to hear um, how you manage, how disruptive it can be in your life, and the fact that it would lead people to feel some of the things that I know tinnitus sufferers feel. You know, I think, well, if I hear a noise, it doesn't bother me. What do you think is, um, how do you explain to somebody that this noise that comes on, and maybe you can talk about yours specifically, how and why it becomes a problem that needs attention and that yeah. why we should be thinking about it and why we should be concerned about those who have this. Sure. Yeah. So my, my tinnitus, well, I should back up a little bit and say that I've had tinnitus for as long as I can remember, like a quiet, uh, a quiet sound. And I can't say I was born with it. I, I don't, I can't remember that far back, but for as long as I can remember, I've had some level of like quiet, like a noise that I could hear in silence. And I thought it was normal when I was a child. I didn't know that uh, everybody couldn't hear this sound that I can hear. When I when I was in my teens, I would go to and started going to parties and concerts and like, you know, weddings and bar mitzvahs and things like this. Like anytime I was in a loud event, it would make my tinnitus extremely loud and, and difficult to, to deal with for like a day or two. Um, but it never really phased me. I just I don't know. I, get, I never never was something I thought I needed to deal with. It, it always went away that those those ramp ups. Um, and it wasn't until Meniere's disease kind of came into my life when my tinnitus changed permanently and for the worse. Um, so <clears throat> to start off, my tinnitus is sort of the classic high pitch tone. I've pegged it roughly around thirty five hundred hertz. I don't know what note on the piano mm -hmm. that would be, uh, but. It's it's a my baseline sound is a constant loud sound that I hear in both ears. Um, it's quite loud even still to this day. Uh, and at times though, when it spikes, I've heard so many other different types of sounds. And that's one thing I've noticed in working with so many different people is every sound you can possibly imagine is something that people hear when their experience of tinnitus. Everyone's experience is so different from like tones and whooshing and jet noises and roaring and crickets and chirps. Uh, even people, I've, I've even worked with people who have like sort of like musical tinnitus where there's mm -hmm. almost like chords or lyrics and weird words mm -hmm. even like that are, that are repeated. Um, but my tinnitus, <clears throat> my baseline is more of the the classic variety. Uh, now I should say I have fully habituated and we will talk more about habituation in a little bit. Uh, so even though my tinnitus is still loud, 99% of the time, I'm just not aware of it. It's it. it and, and when I, it doesn't mean that I don't notice it, I do notice it occasionally, but it's more like noticing my air conditioner turned on when I'm trying to watch TV. Like I notice it and then I go back to my show. There's nothing about the sound anymore that bothers me or hijacks my attention or causes anxiety. Um, but it, you're right that it can become extremely severe and disrupting uh, for a lot of people. And the progression that it goes through is is pretty similar for, for just about everybody. Now, like you mentioned before, tinnitus is not a condition itself. It's, it's a symptom, and it's a symptom of many different conditions um, with completely different underlying causes. And so some of those underlying causes are treatable. Uh, so people should always seek out a qualified doctor and try to treat the underlying causes when possible. Uh, but a lot of times it's idiopathic where you just, there's too many variables where you just never know what caused somebody's tinnitus. Um, hold on, hold on. What does idiopathic mean? I'm sorry, yes. Idiopathic <laughs> means no known cause. Like you can't, you, you, there, there's no, no known or identifiable cause of, of the person's tinnitus or idiopathic just means. Hold on right there though. So it's interesting. So we're, we're, when we talk about your, your story, it's probably the story of a lot of people watching. They're experiencing this sound, they hear it, they can tell you kind of what it is and what it sounds like, but you're, but there's no known cause. Does that alone cause frustration for, for you going, what, what's causing it? I want to get to the cause. I want to get to the cause. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you suddenly hear a loud sound that nobody else can hear, it's absolutely terrifying, right? Just regardless of who you are, most people are find that experience of tinnitus first arising to be uncomfortable at least like not everybody goes into a full-on panic right away a lot of times you don't know what it is in those early days or you have a frame of reference like you've been to a concert where you had temporary mm -hmm. tinnitus for a few hours and then it went away and that's your frame of reference so you're not really worried about it um so you say, you say to people like can you hear that 
can you hear that? I mean, because I know if I hear something, I'll go, can, can you hear that? I mean, is that yeah. a common thing that happens to people when they yeah, hear the early onset of their, yeah, you know, looking common. for the for the buzzing, you know, cable box or looking for the electronic that's stuck on or something? Is that yeah, how? That that I've been through that myself. I, I describe an experience in my book when I was watching TV and all of a sudden like it spiked up in this way that it never had before. And I ran outside thinking that there was like a siren going on or something oh. like I, I didn't know what it was uh, only to realize like, oh no, this is my tinnitus and mm. and like feeling that the panic um, mm. sink in. Uh, so yeah, that, that's a very common experience. Um, but you don't really, but in the beginning you don't really know what it is yet. So you think, all right, you know, this, this sound is uncomfortable, but I'll go to the doctor or there, there's, you know, I'm going to deal with this. I'm not just going to ignore this, you know? And so you go to the doctor, but then you run into this, big obstacle that a lot of tinnitus sufferers run into where doctors are just not very well informed about tinnitus. And they'll say things like, oh, there's nothing you can do about the tinnitus or you just have to live with it, both of which are not mm -hmm. true. There's a tremendous amount of things you can do to treat tinnitus and learn to manage it. Um, but doctors say that anyways. And then all of a sudden now you're like, wait a minute, this thing that's been bothering me, like there's nothing I can do. I'm powerless. Like I'm this, this thing that's affecting my quality of life, I can't, I can't do anything about it. And that often just sends people, it, it, the, the vicious cycle of anxiety and fear is sort of ignited. Um, and it's like a downward spiral from there. Like you, you, you start to panic and then you go home, you read, on, you go online and you you read about, you know, the, the online informational landscape for tinnitus sufferers is similar to what it is for Meniere's sufferers, which is 99% of it is terrifying and negative and just paints like the worst possible mm. picture imaginable of your prospects. And so all of a sudden your worst fears are confirmed. Your doctor tells you there's nothing you can do. The internet has confirmed that. Uh, and you can get very quickly, just get caught in this cycle of anxiety and frustration. And then it, it initially like it starts with a fight or flight reaction in the nervous system that quickly exacerbates into something more insidious because normally when fight or flight is initiated, this response where we're activated to deal with dangerous situations, to give us the resources we need to deal with dangerous situations. Normally when the dangerous situation ends, we calm down and then everything right. kind of goes back to normal. The adrenaline and the anxiety goes away, but the tinnitus doesn't go away. And so you get stuck. And that's, that's mm. sort of like the first big obstacle. Um, and then the other obstacle is that the brain and the nervous system for a lot of people are just not very good at telling the difference between like real danger situations and imagined threats and danger situations like tinnitus. But it's not just with tinnitus where we miscalculate in this way. All the time people experience fight or flight when they're not actually in danger, like scary movies are a good example yeah. of that, right? If something jumps out of the dark and you feel that adrenaline for a moment or public speaking, like I certainly felt some fight or flight kind of energy this morning as I was prepping for this uh, discussion. Um, now, of course, the difference is those two examples, of course, are finite, right? Like as soon as I start speaking or the presentation, mm -hmm. ends, I relax or when the movie's over, you relax, whereas the tinnitus doesn't go away. And so you get kicked into this fluctuating and like intensifying state of fight or flight that can never fully unwind itself because the tinnitus doesn't just go away. And then over time, the emotional toll that takes on you, the anxiety, yeah. the emotion, anger, depression, negative thinking, sleeplessness, you know, that, that slow just- down, Slow down for a second. Let me jump in here just to reiterate the importance yeah. of what you're saying, because we need all of our nervous system. We need the fight or flight or freeze response. It protects us. You heard the loud sound, you ran outside. Of course you need to see because you know, you'd have to be in a cave to know that really a plane does sometimes fall on a house down the street or someone does have a car accident at the traffic circle out there or whatever. I mean, weird, crazy things really do happen. So we need that. Yes. But yet um, we're going to try to say that it's the cause of what's making me crazy. And so we have to find this battle. So, I mean, yeah. that, I, that presents this just unique challenge um, to all those who struggle with something that their nervous system gets them in this cycle, whether it's pain, fear, anxiety, pain, or ten tinnitus, pain, uh, tinnitus, fear, anxiety, tinnitus, migraine, headache, vertigo, whatever. So I think the message that we're going to use tinnitus as a, as a symptom that we're going to talk about the nervous system, but this applies to many things. Would you agree with that, that this idea and understanding applies to lots of things? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. The the parallels between tinnitus and chronic pain is, mm -hmm. is it, there, there's it overlaps in almost every way. From it's not just you have this perception, right, and like pain or or the sound. It's not mm -hmm. just the perception; it's everything else. It's the fear of more pain, like the fear of the implication that it's going to have on your life. The fear, the feeling of powerlessness that you can't mm -hmm. do anything to alleviate the you know the discomfort. 
Um, and then the activation of the nervous system and getting deeper into that fight or, fight or flight cycle uh, and then having that just sort of overtake your life. So you're hundred percent right. It's, 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 you also see this with PTSD and anxiety disorders and even depression too, like amongst many other, you know, chronic illnesses and, and, and similar things. You're hundred percent right. Well, I'm just really happy that we have you to talk about your journey, because I think that feeling of helplessness and hopelessness that people get <laughs> with vertigo, with tinnitus is to say, what do I do next? And we look at the symptoms and making the symptoms go away, but there is this whole other loop with the nervous system, with our mind, with our body, with our choices, with our thoughts that we can tap into here when maybe we don't make the symptoms go away, but we sure do change the way the body functions, the way you function. And you're gonna tell me, right, your quality of life that you said. Yeah. I, I. So, so, so I love that. I just had to slow down and unpack that a little bit because I think it's such, it's the power of this message. Sure. Um, it's yeah. not a pill to stop your tinnitus. It is a, a pro, an approach to take the rest of that circle, tinnitus being just only one piece of it, but taking the whole rest of the circle and going, where can I impact any of these other areas where these impacts my nervous system and my mind? Sure, exactly. And, I, and I'll even take that a step further. Um, so I'm trying to think of a good place to, to start here. So with tinnitus, like most people feel their instinct is to try to push it away, right? Like, because and, and we can push away other sounds very easily, but you know, sounds that aren't bothering us. So we feel like we should be able to do that with tinnitus, but we can't because the tinnitus is activating the nervous system in this way you're describing. It's your brain is essentially saying like, oh my God, something horrible is happening. Can you hear that? Like go, your nervous system is saying this, like go deal with that. And, and you're thinking, oh my God, I don't want to deal with that. That's horrible. Let me just relax and, and watch TV. But your your nervous you're fighting against the way your nervous system evolved to protect you from danger, mm -hmm. and this is how yeah. you would want it to react if the danger yeah. was real, right? Uh, but so we try to push it away, we fail to do that, and just become more agitated, more frustrated, and then that just feeds right back into that vicious cycle. But here, here's the key thing, though, is that it's the brain is fully capable of tuning out sensory perceptions that that don't matter with this mental process of habituation. Yep. Something we do unconsciously automatically all the time right so like right now you're not paying attention to your clothing on your skin your back in the chair everything in your peripheral vision around this computer screen sounds right um and we do this with sound it's it's, it's an unconscious automatic process like when you when you're trying to ignore something you're actively giving attention it's only when you place your attention somewhere else that everything else is filtered out but we do this with sound this is how people can you know work in noisy offices and, and um, work, you know, uh, uh, and still be focused and productive or go to a restaurant and have a nice conversation with family and friends. The problem is that with tinnitus, two major obstacles arise that prevent this from happening, right? That, that like disrupt this, this process by which the brain is able to, should be able to filter out the sound of the tinnitus. And it's the nervous system activation is sort of at the root of that. Um, but when you remove, so, so it, uh, habituation is not about teaching somebody brain to do some new thing, or it, it's just about removing the obstacles that are preventing a person's brain and nervous system from ignoring the tinnitus in the first place. And even somebody with extremely severe tinnitus still has these brief moments where they get distracted, right? Maybe they're having an engaging conversation with their loved one or working on something or, or doing some activity they really enjoy. Now, it takes a lot of distraction to actually become distracted from your tinnitus when it's very severe, but everyone can relate to this experience. And I always say like, that's all the proof you need that your brain is at least capable of delivering you the kind of experience I, I, I describe, right? And in that moment, the tinnitus isn't gone, but you have no awareness of it. Your, your attention is entirely somewhere else. And so that's what's possible with habituation. And there's different ways to get there. And we can, well, I'm sure we'll talk about like- I do, I, I do. I wanna, I wanna divine habituation um, and talk about that. But before a person gets to finding out, well, how do I teach my nervous system to adapt? Sure. There might be other things that are thrown at the, the patient with tinnitus yes. um, about distracting. What about masking? Some people say, well, replace it with a different sound um, and, and that should work. Turn this on, do that, whatever, or have a high tech masker in a hearing aid device. Yeah. Do you have experience or can you, from your perspective, not from a medical or scientific yeah, perspective, but absolutely. talk about that. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when I, when I, when I'm working with somebody like I, we, habituation is sort of like the central component that like makes the ch underlying change, you know, working to habituate, to remove those obstacles in the nervous system is step one, but no matter how you go about that, it takes time. And so a huge component of my work is teaching, introducing all kinds of 
coping tools and strategies mm-hmm. and relaxation techniques and alternative sort of medicine ideas, complementary medicine ideas to try to help somebody better cope. And so you've touched on a few of the big ones, right? Like, so masking, you know, what's interesting, like people, masking is one of the few things that a lot of doctors will suggest, right? <clears throat> but there, a lot of them will talk about like uh, white noise or, you know, for some reason, doctors are, love white noise. Um, my, the, the other, so, so masking is, is extremely helpful early on and something that I recommend to everyone. In fact, uh, a lot let's of people- Let's define that. Let's, yeah, let's sure. define that. Go yeah. ahead. You, you want to- yeah. So by masking, I simply mean having background noise playing of some kind. And, and you want to do this at a level that only partially covers your tinnitus volume. You don't want to drown it out completely. As long as you can still hear your tinnitus even a little bit through the background noise and you want to keep it at safe volume levels, you don't want to risk damaging your hearing further either. Um, <clears throat> as long as you can hear your tinnitus a little bit, having background noise on continuously can boost your coping and comfort, like pretty simply, like it's the lowest hanging fruit in terms of coping. And something I tell people like early on, Mm -hmm. as you're, as you're starting to work on this, it's something you want to implement all the time. And it doesn't have to be white noise. It can be anything, nature sounds, podcasts, music, uh, audio books, like any uh, white noise, brown noise, pink noise, like any background noise that helps you to cope and feel more comfortable and relaxed can do the trick. Uh, And in fact, I often recommend like finding a variety of sounds that you can rotate through because if you're just listening to the same sound all the time, your brain will habituate to the sound and start to tune out the sound. Or if your tinnitus spikes or fluctuates, like the sound that helped you when it was quieter or sounding different may not be the one that gives you a little bit of relief when, when, when it's spiking very loud. Uh, but masking is a huge and important strategy that I recommend to everyone early on. Uh, and it's something that everyone can do right now if you're, if you're suffering. So what I recommend here is not to get one of those like white noise machines or, or nature sound machines. My, my advice is to buy a Bluetooth speaker, <clears throat> like a portable speaker that you can connect to your phone and then go into the app store, whether you have Android or, or iPhone, it doesn't matter. There's thousands of these sound therapy and nature sound apps. If you search for like nature sounds, white noise, sound therapy, you'll find hundreds and thousands of free apps. I always tell people download a bunch of them and just spend some time going through the app and find like three to six sounds that work well and just keep them on rotation and keep them going all the time. A lot, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people push back on that. A lot of my clients will say things like, you know, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm giving in to the tinnitus or something. Like the tinnitus is winning the battle if I if I use masking, and I don't want to feel like it's a crutch and I have to rely on it. And I always say like that's like the wrong way to think about it. It's it's the lowest hanging fruit that will raise your quality of life up a little bit in the short term, and in the long term you'll be able to habituate and you won't need this anymore. So take full advantage of it day and night. Use it for sleeping while you're working, and and experiment with different ways of listening. So I mentioned. The Bluetooth speaker, hearing aids can do this as well. A lot of hearing aids have tinnitus maskers. And if you have hearing loss, you should always get checked out for hearing loss if you have tinnitus because it's the most common cause of tinnitus. Hearing aids sometimes can just give you relief by by correcting the hearing loss. Also, a lot of hearing aids have either tinnitus masking programs or can be can function as Bluetooth headphones. Um, but also there's mm-hmm. a little little another little tip that I, I like to talk about is something called bone conduction headphones. And these are you can search on Amazon for this and find a lot of good ones <clears throat> for as little as like $30 or as much as close to 200. And these are headphones that don't transmit sound through the ear where, you know, the air pressure wave is hitting the eardrum and going through the middle ear and into the cochlea. It, there's these little pads that press into your cheekbone and it transmits the sound as vibration directly to the cochlea. So your ears are wide open. You don't have to cover your ears. You, it, it gives you the same benefit of masking as hearing aids do. You can hear your masking from your phone and everything else around you. You know, to put on headphones when you're at the dinner table to have your sounds playing is at the expense I, of the conversation. I saw those. Uh, that those are that's magical. Bone conduction speakers really is. is really magical to me. Like, how does that work? I don't even know. But I still don't know how a picture tube works in an old-fashioned TV. <laughs> but but I remember seeing them for the first time, and it was it was neat, and they were made, I think, for sport and things because they allowed you to be still cognizant of transient sure. or ambient noise like if you're running or whatever yeah. skiing i think i saw them in a, in a ski shop um so so those are neat i don't know if people know as much about those as the other things so i think yeah. that's a that's a neat idea for anyone who can't stand anything in their ear or um you know you want to try them they do have those headphones they look like the regular kind of mine, like i have these both headphones but they but they attach to the bone so that's it thank you for that suggestion yeah. and and you're right the doctors are going to try to send you to audiology and maybe give you some white noise recommendations or some 
tell you to put on nature sounds and do all that. And so that's a reasonable approach. So I'm glad that we talked about it because it's a low hanging fruit. I like the way you say that. And it does work for a lot of people if yep. they catch this early on before they've really entered that nervous system cycle of fight, flight or freeze. And, um, you know, it can it can be helpful. So there's it's, it's a wonderful thing to hear people saying, I'm I manage mine this way and it works great. And that is great. But I want to thank you though, just it, it, it can't just to interject, like while masking can be used to facilitate habituation, this is part of the tinnitus retraining protocols, uh, which is a habituation strategy that's been around for several decades now. Like um, for most people, if they're just, if that's all they're doing, right? Like what I always say is like, if you're just turning on background noise when it's bothering you, trying to calm down when you're anxious and, you know, um, uh, uh, trying to distract yourself, like go, 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 go all day long. In a lot of ways, you're just coping, right? So I, I while coping is important and, and necessary for everybody who's suffering, and these are like very simple tools that people can implement, I always want to stress that it's important to actively work to habituate too. Like tinnitus retraining therapy, for example, it's not just masking. It's also cognitive behavioral therapy. And with my strategy as well, it takes, it's kind of, there's other techniques and meditations and things. Um, so that's a perfect segue then into that. So, sure. so the doctor doesn't have a pill to give you, there's not a surgery. Yeah. Right. You get the masking, you, you replace the sound or adjust the sound that way. Now you're talking about something new, habituation. Yeah. Now I, as a vestibular therapist, know the word habituation because vestibular therapy would habituate right. to movements and things. And maybe right. people yeah. in this audience know that word as well to be like, kind of make a habit of something by repeating it. And maybe we're retraining the brain. So is that the same word used in the same way now applied to tinnitus? And tell me about how, how that works. And, and cause that sounds like a, the, a game changer for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I believe, yeah, it is the same word, but in a different context, like in, in, the context of vestibular therapy, my understanding is, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, like this is not my specialty, obviously, like it is for the book for you guys, but um, it's about it's about getting the learning like techniques where you're strengthening the other parts of the vestibular sim system to compensate for the vestibular dysfunction in one part of the system. And habituation is sort of like the brain adapting and rebalancing the different pieces, I guess. Whereas with 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 tinnitus, um I'm more talking about it, I guess it's the same, but I'm, I'm talking about it more in the context of that your brain is able to ignore the sound of the tinnitus, mm -hmm. even if it never goes away, much like how you don't feel the feeling of your shirt against your skin until I just say that out loud. And now everybody's attention is now everyone can feel their shirts on their skin or <laughs> you're back in the chair, you're, you know, everything in your peripheral vision or smells coming from a different part of the house or, you know, there's, there's any number of things we're just not paying attention to on a regular basis sounds too. And we can do this with the sound of our tinnitus. Now I talked a little bit before about how the nervous system builds up and gets into this like vicious cycle of fight or flight and anxiety around the sound because we try to push it away, we fail. Um, but you can, you can completely change the underlying response that's developed in someone's nervous system, the underlying emotional, psychological, and physiological response. And that's the goal of all habituation strategies. And in practical terms, that is the obstacle that's preventing people from being able to tune out their tinnitus all the time, like they already are able to do some of the time. Uh, and there's different ways to achieve this. So I, I want to talk a little bit out about what I did in my journey, because I came to this in sort of a weird way. Um, <clears throat> so backing up a little bit, when when back in uh, a decade ago, when my Meniere symptoms were very intense, I was having like horrible vertigo attacks. Um, just my hearing was affected at the time. I, I had terrible, it, it fluctuated, but it was always bad. The fullness and feelings of pressure in my ear. <clears throat> constant brain fog and fatigue. It was, it was horrible. Like I, I, you know, I, I went through a lot of difficult doctor's appointments and I, mm -hmm. I sort of was convinced early on um, that my life was over, that I just was sort of destined to be disabled. Um, now, obviously that, that didn't turn out to be true. Uh, but fast forward a bit, like once I found that, like doctors who gave me hope and started changing things for me and I started fighting for my health, eventually my Meniere symptoms start, my other Meniere symptoms started to improve. I stopped having vertigo my equilibrium slowly came back. I wasn't dizzy all the time. The brain fog was starting to subside at times. Like I, I, things were starting to stabilize over a period of months, but the tinnitus didn't change. It was the one thing that mm. didn't get better. And I still felt powerless about, and I had gotten no real clarity on like what could be done. Like I was getting a lot of those same messaging, like there's nothing you can do. Um, <clears throat> but one, one thing that was different for me is that I was a big meditator at the time when, when this whole thing, when this like chronic illness bomb dropped in my lap and uh, 
it was the most critical coping tool for me early on. I mean, I'm prone to, I've, I've struggled on and off with anxiety and, you know, my whole life panic, that's not panic attacks and that kind of thing. And so that all ramped up like crazy when I was first diagnosed. Vertigo is terrifying, even if you don't have Meniere's disease, but just having this problem be ongoing is just devastating psychologically. Um, <clears throat> and meditation really was like the big thing that helped me to be calm and, and manage my stress levels, which stress and anxiety are big triggers for all of Meniere suffers and, and tinnitus suffers. And uh, once I got to that point where my Meniere symptoms were better, but my tinnitus wasn't, and that started, the tinnitus became like the sole focus, the thing that was absolutely driving me crazy. And I was sinking deeper and deeper into that pit of despair that a lot of people out there are suffering for, with right now. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't meditate anymore because I would sit down and try wow. to focus on the breath and I couldn't focus all I would just, I'd be in a quiet room and I would just hear my ears screaming and I just wanted to rip my hair out. I had hair at the time and, uh, and uh, it was this uh, horrible experience and I almost stopped meditating. Um, mm -hmm. But one day I was laying in bed and I just kept, I just kept trying, uh, you know, different things. And one, one day I was laying in bed and I sort of, it, it struck me like I had been trying so hard, <clears throat> excuse me, to fight to ignore the sound when I was trying to meditate and I was failing, like it just wasn't working. And I, I wasn't relaxing at all. Like it was just making me more agitated. And then I thought like, what would happen if I focused on the sound instead of my breath and just did that instead? And it was, you know, this isn't like a new idea. This is like a common idea in meditation. Like you go into the thing that's bothering you. Like they'll talk, you know, in mindfulness, they'll talk about pain and boredom in this context, right? But so I'm sure these ideas were floating around in the background. I'm sure I had been exposed to these ideas at some point, but I just had this idea like, because I had meditated with two sounds before. <clears throat> so I said, what would happen if I just focused on the sound? And it seemed like crazy at the moment. When that thought hit me, I was like, oh my God, like it, it, it felt terrifying, but I was willing to do anything and I did it. And two things happened almost immediately that like in, in, in hindsight kind of changed everything. So the first thing is that when my, that my mind wandered away from the sound. So everybody's mind wanders during meditation. What you're trying to get better at ultimately is catching yourself when you're daydreaming and thinking about other things and you bring your attention back and you begin again. That's not a sign that you failed to meditate. That is the practice in a lot of ways. And so, but this Good. time- I like that. I'm, I really like that. I'm gonna stop you there because it is, when we have to go inside and do work like this, it's easy for us to judge ourselves and go like, I can't do that. I'm not good at that and whatever. And so I really like, and I want people to hear that, you know, you, when you find the techniques that work for you, when you find strategies to feel better, look better, perform better, whatever it is, work, work better. You know, we have to turn off that idea of, I can't, I don't yeah. know how I think at this and whatever. So that's yeah. an important layer. Yeah, It's part of the practice and it is the practice. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, that's a that's a great point. Um, and and that and that's something like the, the the thing you're highlighting too, like a lot of people, regardless, even if they're just trying to meditate and they have no health problems, like they'll feel like they're doing it wrong because their mind is constantly wandering and they're distracted. But really, like noticing that is the practice. like noticing it and beginning again is the practice. But anyways, um, so my when my mind wandered, it wandered away from the sound. and I and when I brought it back, it suddenly occurred to me that I just hadn't heard for like, 30 seconds, I was just daydreaming and I wasn't thinking about my tenderness at all. So that was like the first interesting insight. And then the next thing that happened was I was able to get into that state of relaxation that I hadn't been able to for months. And it, and, and, and when it was done, it did, it wasn't quieter, but it, it like, I felt better. Like I, cause I was relaxed. Like it, it wasn't actually quieter, but it felt quieter because it wasn't bothering me as much. Now, of course it, it didn't last that long, but I knew I was onto something and I just kept doing it. And, and I changed my meditation and every day I was doing this and I didn't have the words or the, the background to understand what was happening. But I was, you know, based, the way I describe this is that because meditation is so, can be so calming and relaxing when you practice it and do it often. And because anything can be used as the thing you're focusing on with this type of simple meditation, there's nothing ultimately magical or special about the breath or a mantra or something like that by choosing to focus on the sound of my tinnitus, but still achieving that meditative state, that state of relaxation and calm in doing so, that gave my brain and my nervous system this whole new experience to associate with the sound of my tinnitus. And it was an experience I'd never had before, right? Like most people, until you try something like this, you're either distracted and you're not thinking about it at all, or you're hearing it and it's bothering you. There's no third option where you're engaging the sound and experiencing like a positive emotional state of any kind, right? But this sort of allows that to occur. And now it, it wasn't instant, like I still had spikes. It was not a linear, it's never a linear process, but just with this one meditation technique, 
I was able to like just get better. And all of a sudden, like I just wasn't bothering me anymore. And my brain was tuning it out. And it's funny that this was one like small paragraph in my first book. Like I, it was all I had to say about tinnitus was like this, this technique I had come up with. And I got so much email and, and notes from people about that one paragraph in the book that when I thought it was time to, when I wanted to write another book, I was like, all right, the universe is, is trying to tell me something here. This is a much bigger problem. Like Meniere's affects one out of 500 people, roughly about the same as MS, whereas tinnitus is like one out of 10 to 15. Now, not all of those one out of 10 or 15 are suffering, but like 40% of them are. And so it's in terms of scale, it was a bigger problem. And then, I, then it was at that point where I went back and started researching and understanding and in retrospect, like what did I do? What happened? And then most importantly, I sort of built out a protocol and learned, added in additional techniques and strategies because I knew that this crazy kind of meditation was going to be terrifying for people. So, but that, that's, that was the game changer for me. That was the thing that changed everything for me. And that's, that's, that the core of what I teach to most people. Um, but it, it's, it's more than that. Like I said, it's also like coping tools, coping strategies, learning how to, you know, breathing techniques, relaxation techniques. Um, and also focusing on a long, the long term too, like, because one, one thing that you see with, I, I should mention this, this is important. The vast majority of people who have tinnitus eventually habituate naturally, like j doing nothing. Just if they give it enough time, they're, they'll find some semblance of quality of life, ways of coping, ways of coexisting. This is true. Just, just, it's what we see, like something like 98, 99 percent of people will will habituate to some extent doing nothing. Now, I always say you can't get to nearly the levels of relief that are possible by actively working to change these the nervous system and, and, and to actively work on these things. But just doing nothing, most people will, will get some level of relief. The problem, though, is if that happens naturally and then a, two years later, you know, an ambulance turns on its sirens right next to you on this, you know, while you're on the sidewalk and all of a sudden your tinnitus changes. A lot of times, not only do those people not know like what they like they, they they panic because not only do they not know what to do in that moment to feel better they may not even know what how they got better in the first place and then the vicious cycle can ramp back up so i've like i've i've, I've, I've spent a lot of time and energy like focusing on the long-term aspects mm -hmm. of it as well so of when life eventually throws a curveball at you like ways of thinking about it how to manage that how to how to stay calm and deal with it and then most importantly how to remain habituated when it's all over I have um, a I have a curveball question for you actually from the chat okay. because it, it it kind of ties into everything that you're talking about with meditation sure. these techniques that you've yeah. developed. Um, we have a comment from Darcy who mentions that she is deaf with cochlear implants and she got tinnitus when she lost her hearing, so she doesn't understand music or a lot of noise well. So replacing sound doesn't work well for her. What yeah. other techniques do you have to offer um, somebody who has that curveball in life where things might be a little bit different for them? That is a great question, Danielle. This is something, so I, I you know, it's it's interesting. Like I've actually been able to work with people, not, not profoundly deaf people, but like with people with fairly severe hearing loss. Now there's tools like Google Meet, which will do live uh, transcript, like live captions that are extremely accurate in virtually real time. So like I just recently had a client who did very well, who was almost completely deaf, except for enough with one ear where he could hear speech and we could communicate, but without the captions, it wouldn't have been able to. But th this is something that is relevant because hearing loss is one of the main causes of tinnitus and, and the degree of hearing loss is going to be different, but some people have severe hearing loss or they're profoundly deaf. And then all of a sudden these common coping tools like masking just don't apply to those people, right? A um, <clears throat> couple things. First, I want to just say that like the one nice thing about the meditation approach is that you don't need to have sound. Have I have tools that I created, which we can talk about if you want to, that can make meditation easier for hearing people. But um, the one nice thing about meditation is you don't need your ears to meditate. Like this is this is a this is a mental skill, a mental exercise that anybody can learn. And so, like ultimately, as a, as a means for habituation, like somebody with hearing loss is not. Um, Th th these sort of techniques are still available to those people. Um, but aside from that, coping become like coping tools become a matter of like finding other ways to calm down and relax the nervous system, engaging the other senses. So it's a lot of like muscle, re you know, engaging the mind body connection with like mu progressive muscle relaxation and body scan type mm -hmm. meditations or taking a hot bath or getting a massage or um, learning breathing techniques, like other, uh, other, you know, scent aromatherapy, like scented candles. It's like, there's, there are still many tools available to people who are hearing impaired or deaf uh, that 
and, and techniques that they can learn to calm the nervous system, start mm -hmm. relaxing a little bit, like wind down this activation in the nervous system. And then meditation is still is something that's accessible to everybody, regardless of who you are. So um, I've actually done, a, I, did a, I did a presentation a while back to for the Hearing Loss Association of America, where I talked a lot more about this sort of stuff. But there, there are many things that a person with hearing loss can do. So if you have hearing loss and tinnitus, do not be discouraged by hearing so many people just talk about masking because there are so many other tools that are available uh, that can that can help along the way. So great question. You touched there on a lot of um, complementary and alternative approaches. Yeah. And 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 I like that because we at Vita have a page and are improving and enhancing our our um, articles on complementary and alternative approaches. Sure. Um, are those things part of your program and part of your teaching? Huge. The, yeah. Like the meditation is the the center sort of driver of, of progress with habituation. That's the thing, in my opinion, in my, in my, the, in the protocol and strategy that I teach that sort of chain makes those underlying changes in the nervous system. But while you're doing that, you want to start calm, unwinding the nervous system, calming it down in as many ways as you can. And so I, I'm, I am tool indiscriminate. Like I, anything mm -hmm. that helps people to relax, to cope, to be distracted, like is fair game. And I teach all sorts of things from like, cognitive reframing techniques, emotional reframing techniques, relaxation techniques, breathing techniques. Um, even CBD is something mm -hmm. I talk a lot about, not as a treatment for tinnitus, but just something that can alleviate some of the symptom, uh, the, the side effects like anxiety and stress. Um, but the, the biggest thing for me <clears throat> is has been a tool called brainwave entrainment. This, is, um, this has been like the number one sort of thing that I've had a lot of success with, which is so. Can you say it again? What's the way? Yeah, yeah. So, so brainwave entrainment is uh, basically the name given to a, a, a set of different technologies that have the ability to change your mental state, um, on demand temporarily. So I, I basically, so I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this and succinctly. So I've created like an album of audio embedded with this brainwave entrainment technology that can induce a state of deep relaxation in somebody within minutes, like very quickly. And it's much more than like, oh, this is a soothing sound of a beach that, remind, you know, calms me and I find comfortable. It, it's more than that. It's like by listening to the sound, um, your brain, you, you are, your brain waves are stimulated in a way where you will, you will experience sedation and calm mm -hmm. and it's temporary. It doesn't do anything neurochemically. So there's no dopamine or serotonin being released. It just temporarily influences sort of the dominant brainwave patterns. And this is a measurable change that yeah. you can see on an EEG. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but what's nice about it is it's temporary. As soon as you take your headphones off or turn the music off, your brain just sort of goes back to its natural rhythms. You can't sh permanently change somebody's natural rhythms of their brain with something like brainwave entrainment. But I've created audio-based tools that like the, the ability to help somebody relax on demand like that is extremely valuable. So like I created this whole album that I called the uh, Tinnitus Relief Project. Um, that like, so for example, I have tracks that if you listen to it, it just makes you feel calm and sedated to help alleviate anxiety. Or I have coping tools with that in the background, like guided, guided techniques to like help like emotional and cognitive reframing techniques to help somebody like calm down in the middle of a diff difficult tinnitus spike while this brainwave entrainment is sedating them. Or most importantly, the thing that's made the biggest difference for me and my clients is I created medi this, this meditation thing I'm describing. I, it's not lost on me that the people hearing this are probably thinking like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Like you want me to focus on the sound of the, my, this horrible sound and, and expect to relax. I know the, how, how difficult this sort of thing sounds. And it, like, especially if you've never meditated before to think about intentionally focusing on the sound is extremely taxing and difficult. Uh, so one example of a way that I, I try to help people with this is you don't have to do it in silence. So I, I, I for example, created guided meditations that I, you know, so no one has to memorize anything. They can just follow along with my voice. Uh, the meditations have background noise to mask the tinnitus a little bit. So you're focusing on it at a reduced volume to make that a little easier. And then there's this audio technology that will automatically put you into a more, a deeper state of relaxation than you would have been able to get into on your own with your own meditation ability. And it doesn't matter that you got there artificially. You got there while you were doing these tinnitus guided focused techniques. Um, and so this is like, for me, like in terms of like complementary tools, complementary medicine, this has been the biggest game changer for me and something I've learned quite a lot. You, yeah, you, you're talking, there is a lot of scientific support to, to measure, especially on those EEG waves, looking at those brain waves. It's yeah. like you can get a good night's sleep yes. by listening to yep, some of these things. So those who haven't heard about it or understood it, 
um, again, this is different than nature sounds or right. weather or different or white noise, but these are really specific um, frequencies of sound yeah. that go into the brain, into the nervous system, and alter your wave patterns. And temporarily, or, temporarily, temporarily, temporarily. Ab, ab, just like he said, as yeah. our brain waves change with sleep, we understand good sleep and sleep that's not restful. And so it is an it is a it is an exciting, I think, new territory that will be available to people. So thank you for bringing that up. And I think that that, that is a, gr a, a great thing. And with all the internet access we have, YouTube can play those because you don't need to look at anything. You yeah. can go find them. And I'm sure that you probably have a list of resources. Yeah, there's a lot of free things. ones that I have too. Like if, if people, if you search rewiring tinnitus, you'll see like release audio at the top. There's all sorts of samples and free things you can download and listen to to get a sense of uh, what we're talking about here for sure. So I was going to um, make sure that I that I show them that um, you mentioned rewiring tinnitus, and so I have a yes a Facebook. Um, well, that's your that's URL. Yeah, and then that's also our, that's that's just the URL for my Facebook page if you want to follow along on Facebook. Uh, but my website rewiringtinnitus.com is sort of like my central repository of all my writing, um, all of my. Um, resources my book everything is is there rewiring tinnitus.com yep and my audio is there as well um yeah so people can find out more specifically about some of these techniques that you have and then you also have this mind over meneers and so while we're talking about urls i don't know why those came together sorry i didn't know that would show up okay. like that but you can see all those letters those are yeah. two different things the the website and then the facebook where you have this and you talk about all the things that's worked for you and then the why yeah. they work and how they work yeah. and I, how they yeah. might work for people. Exactly, yeah. My, Mind Over Meniere's was the title of my first book and my first blog. Um, and it's there's a lot more content there than there is on, I mean, I've been working on it for much longer than than I have been on Rewiring Tinnitus, which is now like the, the latest sort of iteration of everything. But I still update both periodically. I send out emails with articles. I still do a lot of writing and videos and things like that. So if you suffer from Meniere's disease, be sure to check out mindovermeniere's.com. Um, but for my tinnitus, it's at rewiringtinnitus.com. So I also have these. That's not going to work. Look very well. Let's yes. see. No, that looks good. That that's the that's the cover of my book. Um, and that's the cover of my first book. Oh, that's Mind Over Meniere's, and then this yeah. is the new one. There that's you go. Yeah. Well, it so sounds that's like a you've had to bring a lot to the table as far as creating your own resources and your own tools, just because it, it sounds like there might have been some gaps in the healthcare system that might have been mm -hmm. difficult to manage or to navigate as you were going through your journey. Yeah. Um, you know, where did you see some of those gaps and, and some barriers <laughs> that uh, people might face that, you know, are trying to get diagnosed or find help with tinnitus? Yeah. So this is the biggest, so there's a huge gap in the tinnitus sort of medical landscape. Um, so, when you're trying to get, when, when a tinnitus patient is suffering and like decides to get medical treatment, like it is, they are about to embark on like what is an insane uphill battle filled with completely unnecessary challenges and obstacles that stand in their way of like finding a person who can treat them and, and help them to find some relief. Uh, the first, the biggest problem is the one that, that shouldn't exist, which we talked about briefly, which is this, this fact that for some reason, so many doctors and medical practitioners say there's nothing you can do about tinnitus or you just have to live with it. And it's it's false. It's completely false. And it also happens to be, the, in my opinion, the absolute worst thing you can say to somebody with tinnitus. The, we, we've talked a bit about fear and fight or flight in the nervous system, but really I, my the way I sort of see it now, the whole vicious cycle with tinnitus starts with this feeling of powerlessness in the face of this difficult problem that's affecting your quality of life. So all the fight or flight, all the fear, all the anxiety and suffering all comes from this like underlying feeling of powerlessness. And so you're already afraid when, when all of a sudden this crazy sound enters your head uh, to have a doctor incorrectly say there's nothing you can do, or you just have to live with it is just, in my opinion, the worst thing you can say to a tendon to suffer because it just serves to reinforce your feelings of powerlessness, to amplify that fear and anxiety. And it and it shouldn't be that way. And I, I just did a whole long piece on this. I'm, I'm a, a writer at a website called healthyhearing.com. I did a whole long article about this. Um, but the bottom line is that like 
it boils down to a few different things. Like one, they don't learn about tinnitus. Doctors generally don't spend a lot of time on tinnitus in medical school. Even, even with like specialties like ENTs and, and audiologists, like you'd think that they would be more informed, but even a lot of ENTs and audiologists will say these things too, which in my, it, in my opinion is like just a, a terrible travesty that this is happening. And just to give you a sense of, of scale, like I've worked, like you mentioned in my introduction, I've worked now with more than 800 tinnitus sufferers one-on-one -on -one, all over the world. Like I've been doing it virtually even before COVID. So I was, I'm, I'm working with people all over the world in all different countries. I've yet to find a single person anywhere on earth that doesn't, that ha doesn't have at least one story like this of a doctor who said there's nothing you can do uh, or you just have to live with it. And, and so the scale of the problem is massive and it goes more, it's more than just amplifying fear. Like everybody knows the placebo effect, right? Like this idea that if you give somebody a drug, like a, 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 a substance in, that isn't an active drug and you tell them it's a drug, like they'll get the benefit in every drug trial. Like there's always someone, who, there's always a table of people who received the placebo drug but experience the full benefit. Not all the people in the placebo group, but there's always some. So that's the power of the placebo, right? Your body can elicit this full healing response, just like you took an active therapeutic. But the placebo effect has an opposite, like an evil twin called the nocebo effect, which is basically, if a doctor tells you that something is going to affect you negatively, it's going to have a negative health out outcome. So it's like the exact opposite of the placebo effect. And there is a, a phenomenon that is called medical hexing, where it's basically the nocebo effect being put into practice by doctors. Like your, their words matter, right? If a doctor tells you there's nothing you can do, you're going to believe that. And that's going to shape your experience with this thing. Um, I, I have this idea that like, if, if doctors everywhere, like if I could snap my fingers and like everywhere on earth, doctors just started talking a little bit differently about tinnitus and change their messaging, that vast quantities of suffering and future suffering would just be eliminated overnight. So that, that's the biggest problem. Like this, it, people go into this world just immediately let down and not given any sort of hope. And my message to all of them is that there is hope. Like there always was hope. It, it feels like you're powerless, but you're not. There's levers to pull and you just need to figure out what they are. Um, was so that, there a clinician that gave you hope in your journey? Was there somebody that you finally came across that switched that light bulb on or was a good yeah. clinician for you? Yeah. yeah. For me, it was, yeah. So that's, a, yeah. It was for Meniere's more than anything that pain, mm -hmm. my, my Meniere, my Meniere specialist, like really was the one that made me understand this idea that hope is like the missing piece for so many people. My first doctor was terrible. Like he was, he, when I, I got, I got so scared and I started asking questions. He yelled at me. He would, I remember him saying like, what are you the doctor now? Like I was just scared. He was telling me all these horrible things. I'm going to lose my hearing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm in, you know, 23, 24 years old. I was panicking. Like, um, and I left that day just broken. And then I went online and just saw the worst possible things ever. And I just went into the deepest, darkest depression. My family didn't give up though. And they pushed mm -hmm. me to find a specialist. So they, they got, they, someone in my family, I think my grandfather, Eddie just made me this appointment, uh, at the university of Miami with a neurotologist. So this ENT subspecialty where they focus on hearing and balance disorders. I didn't know any of this at the time. I just was told this is a Meniere's, someone who specializes, go see them. And it was a completely different experience, like mm -hmm. worlds different. They were patient with me. They mm -hmm. told me about other patients who were doing well. He, you know, he told me that um, there, if, if I got a handle on this, there was no reason to just expect to go deaf. That like, if I could, if I, if I was able to, if we were able to mitigate the vertigo attacks or the intensity that there was no reason to think I was just slowly going to go deaf. The one person I knew in my personal life that had been years was completely deaf in the ear that they had it in. And I had it in both ears. So like I had this, like, I was terrified that I was just slowly going to go deaf. Um, and a lot of people do. I, I fully, I should say, I fully recognize that I'm lucky that with a lot mm -hmm. of lifestyle management, like I haven't needed any serious courses of medication or surgeries or anything. Like I've been able to stay ahead of this and not everyone is as lucky as me. Like, so I fully, I fully recognize that. Um, but just to, just to finish your, your question, he, he told me about patients who were doing well. He told me all these different things we could try. And if this doesn't work, we'll try that. He told me like all the changes I had made were the right ones. He suggested supplements and exercises and like I didn't even know that there was a world where I could, where I might be okay until I met that guy. And it's crazy to think what my life might've looked like had I not met him. Like he changed every, it wasn't until, like, that was the light switch moment for me. And like, I get, <clears throat> I get emotional sometimes thinking about it because like it was, I was just going in a straight downward spiral, like until that moment. And that, 
I started fighting from that well, point you, forward. You found the right person and it sounds like you, you eventually got pointed to the right resources yeah. too. How did you get involved with Vita? Did Vita give you any help or resources yeah. along the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, um, Vita was one of the first, I mean, there wasn't much, there, there, it was so negative, like all the support, support groups, while they can be helpful for some people, like it can, they become echo chambers of like suffering a lot of times. And that can be when you're dealing with like a problem where anxiety and, and stress is making it worse, like just reading about the suffering of others is not, not, not really a good thing. You're, 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 you're amplifying the fear and anxiety rather than like, you know, the calming of the nervous system. Um, Vita was one of the first resources I found that actually gave me some like solid information that, that I, that gave me some good tips and advice. And, um, when I, when I started writing, I decided I want to just give back and just be a part of, like, I was getting such a positive response to my Meniere's articles. Like I, 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 when I started, it started with this idea that I wanted to write a book. I didn't know what I was going to write about. I just, it didn't even occur to me that I, to write about Meniere's. It, it's just that, that came later when I realized, oh, this is something I know a lot about. I wonder if people, other people are scared and suffering like I was and would find like my journey helpful. Right. Um, but I, 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 everything I did, I, decided from day one was like, there is hope. Like that was the message in my book. There is hope. It feels like there's no hope, but there's hope. Right. And I, everything, I started writing all these really positive articles and things I was doing and I was getting to test my ideas as I was writing the book. And I got such a positive response from people and I was overwhelmed. Like I couldn't believe, like, I was like, wow, I, I must've tapped into something here. And I just wanted to just do more and give back. And it was around that time, like, or short, maybe within that first year or something that I, I decided to volunteer with Vita and become an ambassador. And here I am <laughs> all these years later, I hadn't done anything with tinnitus at the time. I remember I was, it's funny. I was looking back through some of my old notes and I found, like, I remember I'd advertised on the Vita website when my book first came out and I was finding all the old art and the brainstorming I had done on that. So, um, yeah, Vita was huge in those early days for me. And I just wanted to give back ever since and have for, for a lot Love of years it. Yeah. So finding the right the right person to work with you who can understand mm -hmm. what's going on and oh, point certainly. you in the right direction, finding the right resources is yeah. huge. Yeah. And then filling in those gaps and the needs that you have recognized and mm -hmm. your personal journey and giving back is just something that's amazing and that we really, really value, especially here at Vita. Um, a lot of these uh, journeys are very personal, but they're not you. They're not super unique in that there are other people going through exactly what you're going through. So yeah. we truly value people like you who volunteer your time to reach out and help others that are suffering. So, I mean, coming on this Facebook live today was just absolutely amazing. And we, we really, really appreciate everything that you are putting out there for us. And if you are watching, make sure you go through the comments and look at all the resources that have been posted in the threads. There are article uh, links, to, um, Lem's articles, his websites, uh, Mind Over Veneers, his books, and um, even some of the brain um, and training that he was talking yeah. about. So maybe I have one for Meniere's as well, too, just to throw oh. that out. And that's a free one on my Mind Over Meniere's website. I created the Brainwave album just with like calming tracks and tracks that help you focus if you're feeling brain fogs, things like that um, on both websites. But Rewiring Tinnitus and Meniere's, I've done audio um, for both. Yeah. So great. Yeah. Well, I, I want to go back and take you back before we started talking about Vita, which is which is wonderful, and thank you, and I, I agree with her on uh, how we appreciate you, I want to make sure we leave people with the right idea about doctors. While you had some negative experience from your doctor's visit and they told you they didn't know what to do for you, I just want to make sure that people know it is important to see a doctor because they will rule out things that yes. require medical or surgical or pharmacological intervention. Yes, so the absolutely. best news is that you leave there with knowing what it's not. Okay. Yes. And in Glenn's case, he learned what it wasn't, but he also learned what it was. And so maybe some of this applies to you. You know, you may or may not have had a hearing loss that they discovered on that day, but they told you you didn't have an infection and you didn't have a canal blockage. Those things can cause tinnitus. Yeah. You didn't have a head injury. You probably had an MRI down the road or somewhere. A virus or something. You, yeah. you didn't have a neck injury. These things can cause that same symptoms. They looked at your medicines. And so medicines and polypharmacy or interactions with drugs can cause this ringing in the yes. ears. You also learned that they looked at your ears and your bones in your ear were functioning properly, perhaps, because something called otosclerosis can cause tinnitus. Yep. Eustachian tube dysfunction, jaw or TMJ, acoustic neuroma, don't forget the most common benign head tumor. 
can That's start right. with understanding that you have a hearing loss and or tinnitus, and that would have to be addressed. So again, the doctors play a role, and I wanna make sure the best news is you leave there saying you don't have these things, and you learned at some point that you had Meniere's, which did you know, accompany one of the biggest symptoms of Meniere's is ringing in the ears or tinnitus and vertigo and fluctuating hearing loss, so or low frequency hearing loss in most cases. So blood vessel disorders like cardiovascular problems also can manifest as ringing in the ears and Heart noise. And when, when it's with certain pulsatile. Other, yeah, blood vessel disorders, yeah. oftentimes you'll, that'll manifest as pulsatile tinnitus. So real quick, if you, if you have pulsatile tinnitus, sometimes that can be corrected with surgery if there's an issue um, in the vascular system or the circulatory system, or it can even be like a dehiscence of the semicircular canal, SC. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, all of which, if can, if you can diagnose it, can be corrected uh, and potentially cured um, with surgery. So you, you're 100 right. And just to, just one to build on that, Kathleen, with one thing, find a. It's a, I always tell people like find a doctor that like gives you hope. If you and if you don't like it, you're not going to like every doctor, right? And you may be limited in terms of the medic, you know, the doctors you can find. I am not saying there there are extremely wonderful. Um, tinnitus specialists and doctors and practitioners who do take like this multi-disciplinary approach and are very knowledgeable and kind and compassionate and patient, right? Um, so do, to try to find those people if you can, or, or at least find someone that doesn't make you feel, that, he, that you feel heard, like, but, but well, definitely and, start with the doctor. That's 100%. Absolutely. And even if they do make you feel bad, because I can't say that everybody has good bedside manner, but you also know what you got out of that. You got something yeah, out of it, which is, I don't need you. Thank goodness I don't need you because I don't like you. So go and do the next <laughs> thing, you know, whatever it is. But but again, the mindset of it's important to check those things off. And I want people to have that, that balanced, healthy mind approach about, you know, I need to go know that it's not these things. And Absolutely. that this doctor isn't a part of my medical team going forward, maybe. I don't need them. Thank goodness I don't need them. Then go on. So do rule out those things. And in honor of... Healthy Hearing Month, I want to make sure that we also talk about risk factors that can lead to hearing loss and tinnitus, including loud noise exposure. Aging can cause these things. That's the idiopathic or the age-related changes that happen in your ear that just with the loss of those nerve fibers and, and um, you know, hair cells that you can get tinnitus. Men get more tinnitus than women for some reason. Tobacco and alcohol can contribute to it and then other health problems like we talked about with regards to cardiovascular or vas vascular disease. Um, head injuries and TMJ and, and the like, but I think we've I think we've done an amazing deep dive in into this topic. Uh, a symptom which is elusive, which is confusing, which is frustrating, obviously. And I think you've shown us how to be the vestibular warrior, uh, the tinnitus warrior. I know I go back and forth in how I say it. I bet if you if you <laughs> re-listen to this tinnitus and tinnitus, I say it both ways. But um, however however you are, I think you've given people hope that it's something that can be managed, something that you can live with. And it sounds like your strategies really um, could help people feel better and function better in many, many ways. And just and just wake up in the day and keep keep fighting the good fight, knowing that maybe they can't take away that symptom, but they certainly can teach their brain to work around it. What I always say is you can, you may, not everyone can maybe habituate with my techniques to the extent that I have, but everyone is capable at bare minimum of habituating some way to the point where their quality of life goes up. Like I always, in terms of thinking about progress and like when people, when I'm working with people, I always bring it back to like quality of life, right? Like you, you can't make the tinnitus go away, but if you can restore your quality of life to the point where it, before the tinnitus started, like, then it doesn't really matter that the tinnitus didn't go away. If your quality of life is back up to what it was. Right. So uh, bringing it like you're, you're hundred percent. Right. But I, that's, that's how I like to think about it is like, you can rate, even if you, if it doesn't go away ever, or if it stays loud, or you still don't like it, you can raise your quality of life. And, and it's not just my strategy that I've talked about today isn't the only one. There's other habituation strategies. There's, there's tons of other tools we didn't get to or discuss, right? So don't ever give up hope, everyone. Like if you're suffering and you haven't found that support yet, don't give up. Try something else. Just keep fighting because there is hope. Well, thank you. I think some people learn, we learn the most by being in community with each other. And one of the things that VITA does is continuing to provide education and opportunities for people. So we have our VITA's virtual conference coming up again this year, and we'll be collecting uh, speakers and groups where you can interact with professional speakers, as well as ambassadors and other um, people who may be experiencing vestibular symptoms like yourself. That's coming up. Go to VITA and register for that. You'll see where to do that in the comments. 
And um, also, if there's other topics you'd like to hear Danielle and I talk about, please send us some ideas in the comments. We try to schedule as far out as we can, and we are certainly looking to meet the needs of the things that you guys want to work on. Know that the Vestibular Disorders Association is a nonprofit organization and we depend on them. We need your financial support. So if you feel inclined is, uh, to volunteer your time, your energy, your efforts, your skills, whatever those are, or even your dollars, we really do need and appreciate that. So we can keep bringing this quality educational information to you. So um, that's all I have. Is there anything anybody else has before we sign off? I'll just say I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you guys today. And if anyone wants to reach out and connect with me, uh, you can you can find all my work again at rewire on tinnitus at rewiringtinnitus.com and feel free to email me uh, directly at Glenn G L E N N at rewiringtinnitus.com. Um, and if you want to work with me or anything like that or questions, I'm I'm always happy to to connect and, and support people in any way that I can. So please feel free that. to reach out. That's wonderful. This will be available to re to watch later. To, so share it with your friends and people who you wish were here watching. Anybody you know that has tinnitus or needs to learn about it or support someone who does have it. These will be available on Facebook and on the Vestibular Disorders YouTube channel. Thank you all for coming and we look forward to seeing you next month in the Vestibular Disorders Association video education series. Bye for now. Bye everybody. That's, that's me. Hang on. <laughs> Go to vestibular.org for more videos like this one. Also there, you'll find information, support, and encouragement to help you find your journey back to balance.